All right, we're going to take some time here and answer a letter that we received from a young uh, Jewish lady, a young lady, and um, she did not share her name, and so we're not even going to give any kind of clues as to her name or where the letter came from or anything else, um, but this is going to be very true. Uh, some really good questions. If you are Jewish and uh, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Messiah, um, I think you might find some of these answers to be very interesting. And uh, what we did is uh, I had my wife, Sister Catherine here, I had her um, edit the letter to take out any kind of a thing that might identify um, who this young lady is. And again, we're doing that because her family is still Orthodox Jewish, so there can really be some problems there. Um, I've studied, studied a little bit. I'm still studying a lot of the Jewish uh, culture and customs and things. And, um, you know, there can be some real big family problems if they find out that you've, you know, become a true Christian. So, um, go ahead. You can, you can go ahead and read it. And then first part is addressed to her. And we'll both kind of answer some of these questions, but primarily her. And then the, the last part is for me. Here, so here. It just, it starts out, you know, Brian and Catherine. And then... Um, she says she's... Um, She's living at home with her parents, essentially. She says, I am 24 and plan on staying there, meaning at home, until the Lord gives me a husband. Well, so here are my questions. Go. Yep, good to stay at home. Uh, for Catherine, I have so many questions about being a good sister in Christ and housewife and mother. I would love for you to do a study on how, if the Lord puts it into your heart. But a few questions. One, how to be a good housewife. Two, how to be a godly mother. Three, how to meet a godly husband. So okay. Those are the questions for me. Should mm -hmm. I read? We'll just, we'll just, we'll answer the questions as we're going down through. Okay. Um, so number one, how to be a good housewife. And actually, let me say this. Um, she was actually planning a big study, and uh, we'll be talking more about this as we go through, but a lot of things that, that, you know that my wife here has been studying and researching for years it's just the subject is so huge it would be better actually to write it into a book so uh, that's that's kind of a prayer request that we have because um, we're quite ignorant I'm, I'm good at doing video but writing books and things don't have a whole lot of information on that but we'll we'll talk more we're gonna be say, saying something else about that here as we continue but she was actually we were talking about a sermon idea of how to make a lot of money by being a stay-at-home wife. I said, well, huh, what? You make a lot of money by saving money, by not right. spending money, okay? In other words, a woman that has to go out to her job, well, her husband has to go to his job, so either you have to drop one or the other off at work and then the other one goes to their job in one vehicle or you have to have two vehicles. That's what most people do. Another vehicle, that much more expense, insurance, gas, maintenance, everything, okay? Mm -hmm. Then she has to have a cell phone because she has to get in contact with her husband if her car breaks down and then she's got to have clothes for work and she's got to have the da, 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 and, and pretty soon a lot of things happen there. A stay-at-home wife says, okay, I'm going to learn how to cook and clean and things so we don't have to be going to the restaurant all the time. I'm going to learn how to be <coughs> prepare things and, and make clothing and whatever and you can actually save quite a bit of money. Um, yeah. We save a lot of money because my wife here is a good keeper at home. So that kind of answers some of the questions, but you can get into more detail here. I just wanted to say that, um, yeah, we could do studies, we could do videos, but honestly, um, I think in the future it's going to be more writing on her I'm end of the ministry. Writing. Yeah, she's a bit much better writer than the video thing. She she honestly has never touched uh, the video editing software. She doesn't know the first thing about it. Uh, that's all me. That you know, I do all the video editing. And she doesn't want to learn it, and I don't want to teach her. <laughs> so I do the video ministry. You know, I was in the video ministry long before we ever met, you know, five years before we met. So um, anyhow, but go ahead. Question number one, uh, how to be a good housewife? Well, it starts um, while you're single. As a, a newly Bible-believing Christian young lady, um, it starts... At the moment you get saved um, you know if your family's pushing you to get a job and work outside the home uh, whatever your learning style is 
present to them your case. Okay, for instance, uh, you you show them, look, if, um, you know, I'll do the house cleaning, I'll help out with cooking, I'll help out with whatever chores are around your place. If you live in the country, you know, your chores will, your chores will most likely be, you know, agricultural, you know, raising critters, raising livestock. Um, if you live in a suburban or urban type of environment, your chores will be unique to that environment. So wherever you live, uh, you know, take note of, of the daily responsibilities of your parents. You know, if you need to have your chores written down, um, I know that helps me a lot. I have to write things down. Otherwise, more than a few things on my mind at any given time just makes me forget the rest of the stuff on my to-do list. Um, you know, so if you have to write things down, go ahead and do it and work with your family, your parents especially, on what needs to be done every single day, mm -hmm. you know, specific times, whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, learn to be good at those at those duties because they will serve as a, as a platform for future purposes. For instance, uh, you know, your parents see um, that you're doing, you're being faithful and the small things that they give you, the initial mundane duties, so to speak, around your property and around the home, well, they see that and they say, okay, you know, our daughter is doing great, so we're going to give her a little bit more responsibility. Now we're going to ask of her this other stuff, which is ironically found in, in the King James Bible because the Bible says, what about being faithful in the little things versus the big things. Yeah, if you're faithful, in the, I can't think of the scripture reference right now. Um, but you know, if you're, the Lord will commit to you things that you can be faithful in, and, and He won't commit to you the really important stuff until you can prove that you're faithful in the little things. Right. Um, in other words, with you know, with your family, it'd be just like uh, for a young lady at home, you know, uh, clean up things when your mother and father haven't even told you to. Right. You know, um, just say, hey, I'll do the dishes tonight or or I'm going to go clean the bathroom or something like that. It's again, it's a good thing. It's it's preparation for your eventual married life mm -hmm. uh, where you get into the habit of just really being a good keeper at home. You're saving your parents stress. You're saving your parents money, you know, things like that. They say, hey, do you think, you know, if your mother would say, I'm just kind of tired. I don't really, you know, maybe we would just go out to, to eat tonight or something. You'd say, hey, how about I cook a meal? I'll cook. We don't have to go out to eat. Let's right. Let's save the money and things. And again, that's going to help you in your future. Every marriage, unless you're like, have very wealthy parents that give you lots of money, which is a bad thing, every marriage is going to have financial problems at first. Okay? It's that first shaky kind of a thing where the young man and the young lady come together and they're married now and it's they get an apartment or uh, if they can afford a house or whatever. And there's a lot of financial uncertain times there until the young man has a good job and and is able to provide and and you really get to know each other and things it's very very um, kind of scary at first and a lot of marriages fall apart I would say probably the number one reason for divorce is financial problems so it's good that's why you practice some of the stuff just real quick here we're not going to go through the verses but if you want to study Proverbs chapter 31 very famous um, portion of scripture, verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. Um, that's something that uh, a young man is going to seek for. Okay, Again, if you're practicing these things, and it goes down through and it says about uh, verse 13, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. Um, she's good at, at crocheting, knitting, making fabric, sewing things, stuff like that. That's Those are good things to study as a young lady. And um, but, you know, it says there, worketh willingly with her hands. She's not having to be told to do things. She just gets into the thing of saying, I enjoy this work. I enjoy staying busy and active. Um, and, you know, it, it's just a good thing to do. And read down through, you know, Proverbs 31 there, verse beginning in verse 10 down to verse 31. And just kind of make that your the role model there for your life as a, as a young woman. And... Um, so that's how I would say that. Right. Um, how about number two? How to be a godly mother? Well, what advice would you give there? Um, <clears throat> it goes without saying, you know, you can't be a godly mother 
unless you're a keeper at home. Because if you're working outside the home and you're a mother, well, uh, there's going to be a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Very, very big problems. Daycare. Yeah. Expenses terrorism. of yep. all kinds of stuff. People complain, children are so expensive nowadays. That's because they're career feminists. You know, both parents are working outside the home, uh, earning an income and getting all this stuff to keep their children occupied when really mm -hmm. the children need structure in their daily lives. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you need to have structure for your children. You know, what are they into? If your children, if your child or children don't like toys, uh, stay away from the toys section. But explain to them, you know, that the reality of toys, how they're they create an artificial reality you know if they're if they love the outdoors allow them to be outdoors you know as much as they want you know um, but always safeguarding them from danger you know mm -hmm. uh, depending on your environment but you know the whole thing is is when you're wrong tell your child you know I'm sorry you know I was wrong on whatever the case may be or right you know just stay humble. One of the, of course, the most famous verse in the, in the New Testament is 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. I will, therefore, that the young women, younger women marry, bear children, so you have the children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Um, bear children, but it says guide the house. A lot, of, a lot of these feminists out there in the world, they think it's somehow demeaning in things. That, that what the Bible says is a good thing for women is somehow demeaning. Oh, no, it isn't. Guiding the house is a great responsibility. And, again, it starts with that early time before you're even married. That's the best time to plan for children. It seems kind of weird, but, you know, um, to learn things and to study things and to say, okay, um, I mean, I'm kind of jumping ahead here a little bit, but you have a thing about collaring. You like to collar and, and stuff like that. And having that kind of a developing an artistic type of a thing where you're collaring, it's connecting your mind and your hands. And that's a very big challenge for raising children, um, getting them to make that connection between their brain and their hands. Uh, you know, a lot of children today, the big problem is their brain is being stimulated through television and videos and whatever else, Technology. but there's nothing coming down to the hands. They have no ability to work with their hands. And again, if you're learning that, to be a good housewife, you know, doing things, crocheting, knitting, whatever, if you're doing, learning that, well, guess what? You can impart that knowledge to your daughter in the future. Right. You can say, hey, collaring these things, I can teach my son that eventually, or daughter. You can teach them these things. Um, you're passing on the things that you're learning. So learning and studying to be a godly wife will translate into being a godly mother. And, mm -hmm. of course, another thing I have to say is... Uh, the thing of natural free birthing versus the midwife, or the, not the midwife. The midwives are biblical. That's there's nothing wrong with having a midwife. That's that's good, but preparing yourself by eating the right foods, getting yourself you know in, on a good diet and things like that. Um, that's going to be really good. I mean, if you eat really junky food, when you become with child, eventually, it's going to hurt the child's development. There's going to be birth problems there, and it's going to make your labor and delivery very very difficult um, you know staying in good shape physically and things like that getting plenty of exercise again is going to make birthing a much easier process there's going to be less chance for for damage to the child uh, and the, to their brain and things like that so there's a lot of different angles to it and speaking of daily exercise by daily exercise we are not implying get a gym membership at the fitness center, the stupid no. fitness center, the gymnasium or the field house or whatever is available in your area. No, exercise, I'm talking manual labor of, you know, um, instead of washing your clothes in the machine and in the dryer all the time because those things tend to wear out the fabric of your clothing a lot quicker than doing it by hand, you know, try an experiment, test out, you know, be a scientific nerd, so to speak, at home in your spare time of what would happen if I hand wash my clothes? You know, I pre-treat by hand with, you know, different different types of soaps, like uh, mm -hmm. lye soap versus the store-bought stuff, you know. 
maybe mm -hmm. you could make your own soap and see how that works. You know, just experiment with different stuff because yeah. you're getting exercise by doing laundry by hand, for instance. It's mm -hmm. great exercise. And and a lot of young couples, when they first get married, they complain about, oh, we have to go to the laundromat all the time and we can't mm -hmm. afford a washer and dryer. And it's just like, well, actually, you don't really need one. I mean, what did people do for thousands of years? I mean, we have literally, when we first moved here to this house, there was a clothes washer in the basement and the drain water, all the soapy water and the dirty water and things, went into the sump pump hole that feeds back into our well, into the spring that we have that we get our clean water to drink. <laughs> it's like, think that one out, you know. People weren't were kind of crazy that lived here, but the whole point is we haven't had a clothes washer and we don't go to the laundromat. You mm -hmm. know, we have, they have a breathing plunger thing. It's, I, we showed it in our natural free birthing video and you can plunge the thing and it pushes air down through and up back through the clothes and it gets it uh, cleaner actually than you get from a washing machine. A washing machine, yeah. Much, much cleaner. A washing machine, it just kind of like moves it around like this and kind of sprays water on it. It's actually very inefficient. Right. And the plunger thing goes way back. You know, the people were doing it that way. The thing of a washboard and things, um, you'd be amazed how clean you can get clothing. Mm -hmm. And again, and that's just one example. You know, right. even the thing of washing dishes and, you know, scrubbing things and sweeping and mop, you're going to be in good shape. Right. I mean, Instead of your dishwasher, wash your dishes by hand. You yeah. know, I found, and maybe it's just me, but I found that um, if I have some kind of a cut or, you know, dry hands or something, somehow my hands end up healing because of doing dishes. And, you know, I don't know why that is, but I've, you know, I found that uh, my hands will improve from washing dishes, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so the... There's a lot of different yeah. things with it. I mean, and, and, you know, don't get frustrated if you're like, Man, you know, there's so much stuff that they're saying to do. You'll learn things. The Lord will direct you into things and stuff. You know, just start out small and kind of work up from there. Um, right. Hey, I'll take care of the dishes. Let me work on the dishes. Hey, I'll clean the bathroom. Nobody has to ask me to do it. Right. Hey, I'll this, hey, all that. Hey, could it, you know, if your mother knows how to sew or crochet or something, say, Mom, could you teach me how to do that? Right. I'd really like to learn from you. That's another yep. thing, again, showing honor to your mother and things, and uh, that's that's real good. You know, surprise your, your parents, especially with a surprise meal. They're thinking, okay, we're going to have, you know, whatever, and you say, actually, I made a special dinner for all of us, you know, or mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. I made breakfast for the next several days because that way it takes less time away from you getting ready for what you need to do, you know, for your father getting ready to go to work and uh, whatever your mother is doing, it'll help out with what she needs to do in her typical day. Yep. So. Number three, how to meet a godly husband. Well, um, the best way I can answer this is uh, prayer and fasting. You know, get uh, buckled down, so to speak, into reading your Bible on a daily basis. You know, when I... Um, in early in my salvation years ago, um, I ran across this, this sermon, and I forget who said it, but um, who preached it, but um, it made an impact on me. And, you know, if you're, if you're wondering how much to spend in the Bible each day, start out small, okay? A chapter a day, you know, to keep the devil at bay, so to speak. You know, do one chapter, work, at it, work your daily duties outside of your one chapter a day. Next day, do two chapters a day. Keep adding another chapter each day until, you know, you're able to, um, until you're able to study for however many chapters you have that day while also juggling your duties for the day, you know. Um, you know, work it into your schedule. If you have, if you have uh, multiple duties to do, well, at the beginning, it's going to be very easy to just sit down and um, and say, okay, my chapter a day is first thing in the morning when I get up and then I'm going to eat breakfast. And then the rest of the day is mine to take care of the rest of the duties, you know, and that's how I started out. You can start out just, uh, both feet, so to speak, and the water and, and say, I'm going to read however many chapters, you know, before I started my to-do list. 
however it works for you. Mm -hmm. But daily studying and reading your Bible is essential. Um, daily prayer is essential. I fasted for a while and, um, and I wrote down what I'm looking for in my ideal husband and I was ignorant of a couple of things at the time. I thought, well, uh, you know, I'm just an American. I'm nothing special, but, um, you know, there were certain things I wrote down. My, my future husband must, whatever, whatever I wrote down. And, uh, you know, I prayed for those things, you know, um, in the course of my day. And then I pretty much just closed up my notebook and I said, okay, well, I'm getting back to my study. And I was constantly praying and fasting, you know, while I was, um, studying my Bible. And, um, one day I got into an altercation with my parents and they, and they kept on pounding it into me. Are you looking for a job? Are you looking for a job? And, uh, I finally got to the point where I said to myself, I can't be honest with them because if I'm honest, they're just going to blow up at me again. And, you know, use all sorts of, of uh, mind control tactics on me to get me to go out and work another job. And, um, so I would flat out lie to them and say, oh yes, yes, but I haven't gotten any calls back. And in the midst of all that, I, I, uh, said in my bedroom one day, I put my foot down, so to speak. And I said, I, Lord, I'm staying right here until you give me a husband. And then I went back to my work of studying the Bible and praying and doing whatever my parents required of me and expected me to do throughout the day. You know, my daily chores are on the property. And, uh, and the Lord answered my prayer extremely quickly. Mm -hmm. We met and were married in three months? Or was um, it five months? Well, it was October, early October when I contacted okay, you. Okay, no, then it would have been longer than five months. And then, um... Your infamous statement in March of 2012. What an infamous. <laughs> I call it infamous. Was it, was it said it would be what, about seven or eight months? Um, something like that. Something like whatever. that, yeah. Doesn't matter exactly. And then in May, you came out to get me, early May. Right. So. Um, verse of scripture on that. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing. Don't be full of care about anything. You know, wait on the Lord. Bible talks about back in the book of Psalms a lot, you know, wait on the Lord. Um, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, be thankful for what he does for you. Let your requests be made known unto God. All right. So that's the formula there, praying and things and saying, thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Please teach me more, and whatever else. Um, let your requests may be made known unto God. That's what she did. Right. And the Lord answered um, quickly. Very quickly. So, and um, is that it? Pretty we're much. Gonna get in, we're going to yes. get into a little bit more on this because a little bit. Right. Another question is on this. But pretty much, you know, be specific in your prayer request. You know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think writing it down is also a very good thing. Yes, because and, the Lord know, writes things down. Again, you know, going through Scripture, like I used to pray. Um, there's a verse uh, back in Proverbs. I think it's chapter 18. Let me just find that quick but i would pray this verse over and over and over again and say lord your word says and i remind him what his word says um yeah proverbs 18 verse 22 whoso findeth the wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the lord i'd say now lord i want to be favored by you and i'd like to have a wife and things and you're you know where am i supposed to look and, and whatever else and as i was praying that she was coming to the point of getting saved and things and you know i think the lord really spared her from some really bad things happening in her life and i think it was because he knew he's going to be bringing the two of us together so again you know there could be a young man out there already that the lord's preparing his heart but we'll get back into that here in uh question number two to me and one last thing about uh how to find a godly husband uh Stay away from, quote-unquote, Christian dating sites online. Yep. Don't do the, that stupid nonsense of paying for an online membership for a dating site. You're not going to find the type of husband that the Lord wants for you, okay? The Lord has the perfect man picked out for you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's stupid to spend money looking for someone to marry when 
you're just going to be vexed, okay? As a babe in Christ, you know, you're going to have discernment, you know, a certain level of discernment where you say, okay, I don't know why, but this guy over here run, rubs me the wrong way. Or, you know, um, okay, he's known as a, um, coming from a highly Masonic family in the community or whatever the case may be. I don't want anything to do with Masonry or whatever, yeah. you know, you're going to have discernment to a certain level as a new babe in Christ. So, uh, you know, save your money. Don't worry about finding a godly husband. Uh, you know, regardless of your family pressuring you to, you know, do you have a boyfriend yet? Are you getting married yet? You know, just, mm -hmm. you know, shrug that off and say, if I have to remain single, then I'll remain single, whatever the Lord's will is. And just go on about your business and taking care of your daily chores yep. and studying and reading yep. your Bible. And, but God's going to be sensitive to the fact that you want a husband. Right. You know, he'll be sensitive to that. He'll take care of that in his timing. Yes. Um, go ahead. You read the things, questions for me. For Brian, number one, if you were never exposed to the Bible or KJB, i.e. third world country or other versions of Bibles, will they go to hell? Or would you be treated like a child, ignorant slash unaccountable? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you the verse of scripture on that. Um, I would say, first of all, that uh, you can get saved um, when you hear the gospel. And I, I'm careful because if I say you can get saved from a new version, people go, oh, then the new versions are okay. No, 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 no. But I'm I'm simply saying that I actually did a study on um, um, what did I say uh, something about I I did a I did preach a whole sermon out, actually out of the the uh, Dewey Reams <laughs> up there there's red ones that you can see up in the corner there uh, four volumes of the Catholic Bible that was uh, New Testament was written in 1582 Old Testament was fi finished one year before the King James Bible was finished in 1610. So I did a whole study on that and showed from the Dewey Reams Bible, which is the most sacred of the Catholic English translations, um, I showed from there that it you can still you know understand the gospel. Now, I don't recommend the Dewey Reams or any of the other new versions, but I've known of people that have you know put their faith in Jesus Christ, and later on the Lord will show them you know they're using new versions at first, and later on the Lord shows them the King James Bible. But I think the real question here is the thing of um, what about somebody that's in another country that has never heard the gospel clearly presented to them? Um, uh, let's see here. I'm trying to think of where it is. Um, you know, uh, Romans chapter 4, uh, verse... 15 because the law worketh wrath for there for where no law is there is no transgression okay um that's not the verse i was actually thinking of but that one you know it's there and it's saying basically where there's no understanding of the law primarily with young children under what you know you, you kind of call the age of accountability they can't understand that they're sinning against god um but i would say that yeah uh somebody in another country is going to be more judged like a little child um I remember reading a story, I don't know if I have it here right now, um, it might be here, I'm not sure, but there was, a, there was a, it doesn't matter, we won't bother looking up, was Eternity in Their Hearts was the book, but I couldn't even get to the story if I had to, but there was a guy in Papua New Guinea that um, before the missionaries came and brought the gospel to, him, to the, their people for the first time. Uh, he refused to worship the pagan gods and he said I believe that there's only one God and they said well how do you know and he said I don't know I just I feel that there's only one true God and they executed him as a result of that now was that guy saved I don't know I would say there's a good chance of it simply because he wouldn't participate in a lot of the heathen practices and he believed that there's only one true God but he didn't know who he was or what his name was um, but see, I think that guy standing before the Lord, you know, um, I don't know. I mean, you can debate that thing back and forth, and I've gotten into it with some of the brethren on that. Um, I'll show you another verse of Scripture here. 
Uh, the Bible talks of another place about, you know, the verse I was thinking of, and I can't, I don't have any scriptures written out for this. I'm just kind of answering it as quick as I can. Um, there's another place where the Bible talks about these having not the law or a law unto themselves, their conscience bearing witness, you know. Um, uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 22 and 23. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. So he's you know, rebuking them there. They're lost, he's saying, basically. But look what he says in verse 23. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. They were ignorantly worshiping God. Okay? So... If there was one of those guys that died before Paul came there and brought the gospel, would God judge him because and say, "Oh, you have to go to hell because you don't you didn't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ?" The guy could say, "Well, I didn't know about it." You know, they were ignorantly worshiping God. You see, but Paul had to come there and declare him unto them. So, um, that's how I'd answer that question. I mean, and and you can get you know people can debate that thing back and forth. But I've always held to the thing of somebody that never heard in another country, if they're just going along with the pagan beliefs and, and whatever else, just wickedness, living wickedly, uh, they're, when they die, they go to hell, even without ever hearing the gospel. It's because they were just searing their conscience and just being wicked. But somebody that's really trying to live according to their conscience, bearing witness to them and saying, hey, this is wrong, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie. And they're, they're basically following the, the Ten Commandments there in their heart. And they're like, I believe that there's one God. I, I just don't understand somebody like that that dies. I would say, you know, that there's a good, very good chance that they're going to be saved. Okay. So that's how I would answer that. And I'm in no way, because I know people are going to, I latch onto that and say, well, who says you don't have to believe in Jesus? No, that's not the that's not the point here. Okay, the point is somebody that's never heard the gospel and dies believing that there's only one God, and they're ignorantly worshiping that one God. All right, and you know you can and then somebody would say too, well, God will get the gospel to them. Uh, yeah, you can get into all this, but what about this and what about that? So, number question number two, go. Number two, I was always taught that the interracial, interracial marriage being sinful was for the Jews because he did not want his chosen people to be quote-unquote watered down. What light can you shine on this? For myself, my whole family is Jewish. There are not many saved Jews. What do I do? Okay. Um, well, since we're here in Acts chapter 17, verse 26 is the one where people will say, you know, we're all of one blood. And I do believe that, but you have to read the whole verse. Right. Um, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all, of, on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Uh, to reference back to De Deuteronomy 32, I believe it is. Let me just check here. Deuteronomy 32 verses... Yeah, Deuteronomy 32 verses uh, 7... I'll just read it through nine. It says, "Remembering the date, remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Okay, so there are twelve natural boundaries. And see, when you go Old Testament to New Testament." You look and you see, are there things in the New Testament that overthrow Old Testament Levitical law? And when you see somebody in the New Testament saying, it is written, and they quote the Old Testament, they're bringing that Old Testament thing forward and saying, it's still good for today, and still binding for today. Okay? So when you see it says there, hath determined the times before appointed, he's referring to Deuteronomy 32, and the bounds of their habitation. 12 natural boundaries okay and here's the important part verse 27 that they should seek the lord if happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us every one of us uh, god loves distinction 
And so you have a black man, he has a certain distinct characteristic and, and way about him and things like that, and it's beautiful and it's wonderful and it should not be changed. But he'll have to change it if he marries a white woman. And you get some guy that's Japanese or some guy that's Russian or South American Indian and things like this, like an Aztec, Mayan, Inca descendant, whatever. You get them, they all have their own beautiful, unique characteristics, beautiful uh, clothing that they'll wear, traditional clothing, food, uh, just culture, music, mm -hmm. everything. It's, it's extraordinary. I love to see kindredly pure peoples. It's a beautiful thing. But what happens when you join everything together and you mesh everything together, you lose that culture. And, you know, we were talking about um, my mother's uh, parents, my grandparents on my mother's side, my, what, maternal grandparents, I guess you'd call that. Mm -hmm. He was German, she was Scottish. And there was friction all the time. There was a lot of fighting and things like that. You take a German and somebody who's Scottish, well, they're part of the same boundary, technically speaking. They're Northern European, but there's really a lot of difference between the two. And so you want to get as close as you can, and especially with the Jewish people. There's really, really rich, deep culture there. Um, a lot of people have lost their ancient language and a lot of their ancient culture. The Jewish people um, have really held on to it because of God having a hand in that whole thing. So if you would marry some guy from another culture, it's going to be really difficult there. You're going to have a lot of clashes. Mm -hmm. And as far as the thing of what do you do about a relationship and things um, this guy here uh, just to give you an example um, of this he's he was a Holocaust survivor Ben David Liu okay and um, he was a Jewish rabbi went through the Holocaust and everything else um, and uh, he lost almost his whole family and uh, Got, a, got out of the Holocaust, he survived it, he actually escaped from one of these death trains, that, you know, they were taking him out there and stuff, and and a really amazing story, and he became a rabbi after going through the death camps and things, and uh, ended up getting married to a, a Jewish woman, and I think that they had a few children and everything else, and he got saved, and he told his wife about it, and she just blew up, you know, the, I won't be married to a Christian and the whole deal, and he prayed, prayed like you were saying about earlier, prayed very fervently. Mm -hmm. And Lord, please, you know, please, I don't want to lose my wife. And it went a little while and she got saved. And their children, they brought them up, you know, and, and they got saved and things and, and really did some great work for the Lord. So, uh, really neat story. Um, my point being, okay, you're, you know, a, a young Jewish woman and you're saying I'd like to meet a Jewish man but the Jews are primarily lost well um, when we first started writing my wife and I she wasn't saved but I was looking and for the truth desperately she was desperately looking for the truth and you know I talked to her about the Lord and things like that and I gave her links to the salvation message and I sent her some materials and things and she got saved and our, our relationship developed after that so again, if you're studying the Word of God and everything, and the Lord brings a young Jewish man into your life, um, you might be surprised what the Lord will do. Mm -hmm. And he might open up an opportunity for you to witness to, your, to this young man, and he might get saved, and there you go, you got a saved Jewish husband. Um, but, uh, you know, interracial marriage thing, people, they, they think it's some kind of a horrible, racist, bigoted thing to say you shouldn't marry another, you know, race, modern term. Uh, it's not. It's, it's not a, a hateful thing. It's not putting other people down. It's saying, I want to preserve my, my customs, my traditions, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. And just yeah. as a little side note, um, when you when you uh, marry someone interracially and you have integrated children, so to speak, uh, you will have hair problems, worse hair problems than just trying to figure out, you know, uh, why is my hair so tangly or why is it not responding to this type of store-bought shampoo and conditioner and whatnot. Now don't give away future studies. 
I'm not going into much You're detail. Going... I'm just confirming your point. <laughs> she's she's saying this because she's studying the thing of hair and you know the, uh, not washing with shampoo, but actually herbs and things. And it's I a really it's a really really fascinating thing. But I just gotta I just gotta say that because it I gotta spoil it. Yeah, <sighs> you know. But seriously, it is very very interesting and just the different hair characteristics of different kindreds of people. Mm -hmm. It's really really unique. Um, really amazing and that's just one aspect I mean there's other health issues and things again it's going against God's system right you know God wants that diversity he wants people to be as they are and not blend right so um, go on to the next question keep things moving here number three what about dinosaurs how old is the earth um what about dinosaurs well um Job chapter 40, verse 15, Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. Okay, and the people say, well, that could be a rhinoceros, um, or not a rhinoceros, a hippopotamus or an elephant. Uh, except for one problem. Verse 17, He moveth his tail like a cedar, a big tree. In other words, the sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. Okay? Um, an elephant could not be called the chief of the ways of God or a hippopotamus either. Okay? They're big animals. Don't get me wrong. But the biggest animal that the Lord ever created, I think it was either a brontosaurus or a brachiosaurus. Okay? According to what people find, the fossils and stuff like this. I mean, they're huge, big, you know, reptiles, essentially. And, um... The Bible's talking about it. And, you know, the Lord does not say to Job, hey, um, there was once a creature millions of years ago called Behemoth. You know, no. He says, behold now, Behemoth, which I made with thee. You know, it's quite possible the Lord's saying, you know, because the Lord's speaking to Job here in this part. He could be saying, behold now, Behemoth. See over there? You know? And again, the word dinosaur does not show up. I'll show you that. Um, where is the 1828 dictionary? Right there it is. One of them. Not two of them. Let me just show you here really quickly. This is the Webster's American Dictionary of the English Language. No, Webster 1828 dictionary. And let me show you here real quickly. Um, there's a lot of things that are in the modern world that did not even exist, you know, 100 or 200 years ago. And now it just is, is perpetuated as truth. Uh, where are we at here? Dinner time. So it would be between dinner time and dint, I guess. Right would be the place where the dinosaur thing would have to be. Let me show, see if I can get this thing. Um, okay, it's gonna be kind of tricky. You can see where my thumb is there. Okay, dinner time, dent. If dinosaur would have been there, it would have been in between the two. Okay, hopefully you can see that. All right, so uh, what about the dinosaurs? Well. The Bible says, um, you know, behemoth. Leviathan is another one. Um, there's a couple descriptions of what modern people call dinosaurs. Uh, they weren't called dinosaurs. Even 200 years ago, they weren't called dinosaurs. You walk up to somebody on the street and you say, what do you think about the dinosaurs? They go, the what? <laughs> you know, um, but now people come out with this stuff and say, you know, that's that somehow dinosaurs can disprove the earth and whatever else and it's always kind of funny because dinosaurs are actually more advanced in terms of they got a lot bigger than creatures do today mm -hmm. they're just really really huge lizards that lived very long and got very big um, so it's actually the reverse of evolution evolution says they started out small and slimy and they get bigger and bigger and better as time goes by no actually it's they were really big and then now they're getting smaller and slimier <laughs> Um, but how old is the earth? Um, there's debate there. 
Uh, some people say 6,000, some people say 10,000. Um, I'll give you my opinion on that. What you can do basically is you go back to the Old Testament with a lot of the genealogy. You know, uh, it, you know, Adam lived so many years and begat a son when he was so many years old, and and then he lived so many years and he begat a son, and and you can add, you know add those ages up, and you know I think it comes out to like two thousand something years of the genealogy that's given, and then that time period there is when Egypt, ancient Egypt, was around. So you go back to when it, ancient Egypt was around, you get you know right around. Uh, another 2,000 years, you know, B.C., and then you have, you know, the birth of Jesus kind of restarts things there, and you have, you know, essentially 2,000 or so years from then till now. Um, I know that the the dates that a lot of the Jews give and things like that, the Jewish calendar is a little bit different than this pagan calendar that Gentiles use, but the point is it's right around 6,000 years old, Okay. And I'll give you my reason for believing that it's right around 6,000 years old. And the Catholics have messed with the calendar, and there's really no way to know the exact, what is the exact year right now. There's really no way to know that. But I'll show you why I believe it's right around 6,000 years. Um, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, how many days uh, was the Lord creating things and making things in Genesis chapter 1? Six days. And he rested what? The seventh day. But here we see, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. So the Lord set things up that there's four days set here, 4,000 years, and then, you know, there's a break there, and then two more thousand, and then the Lord rests for the last one. So you have 6,000 years of history, and then the final thousand year period is when Jesus Christ will rule and reign from Jerusalem. The nation of Israel is, you know, basically restored at that point. They accept him as their Messiah. And uh, you know, you know, God Himself ruling and, and things on the earth from the city of Jerusalem. So that is, you know, I can't give you the the actual age. I can just say it's right around six thousand years. So next, go to the next one here, number four. I am left-handed. Everyone has told me this is a devil's trait. Is this true? Well, I'll give you the scripture on that. Go ahead. You can t say what you're going to say. Well. Um, my maternal grandmother was ambidextrous and, um, you know, as a lost girl, as a very young girl, uh, she was my favorite person to be around because, uh, she had a meek and quiet and gentle spirit about her. And, um, she, you know, she gave a pretty good example on a number of things for my life now. And, um, you know, I really respected her as a as a very young girl and growing up throughout my childhood and adult years. And, um, you know, I admired the fact that she was ambidextrous. So, in my case, I can't see how that could be a devil's trait, you know, mm -hmm. if you're left-handed or if you're ambidextrous. It's just... Let me just, let me give the scripture where people would try to get that from. Okay, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through 33 it says when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats let me stop there for a minute he's doing this this is the judgment of the nations matthew chapter 25 verses 31 through 46 he does this at the second coming when he comes back and he does this from the city of jerusalem so there's no questioning when the Lord comes back, it's the Jews, okay? They're brought back into the picture there. Um, you can read about that in Romans chapter 11. Um, but it says here, verse 33, And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. So the Lord separates the goats on the left, on his left hand there. And so Satanists have picked up on that and they say, you know, the left-handed path of, you know, magic and things. And, the, you know, and they've made this big thing out of it. 
um, Satan always perverts and twists what God creates. Okay, um, Satan can't come up with anything original. All he can do is just pervert um, God's characteristics. Okay, that does not. This verse does not mean that anybody who's left-handed is a goat and hated of God and whatever else. Not at all. Not at all. Um, I don't really think it's a big deal. I don't see anywhere in Scripture where left-handed people are condemned or something like that. So uh, there's a lot of. Um, gonna look up one more verse. Uh, this would fall under the category of what the Bible calls an old wives' fable. I'll show you that verse. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Okay, There's a lot of things that get passed around that are basically what the Bible calls old wives' fables. All right? um, you know, they'll, they'll come out with some of this stuff, and, and uh, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, if there's any clear scripture that says left-handed people are, are somehow demonic or something like that, show it to me. There isn't any. Okay? So, you know, don't worry about that. Um, next one, number five. I color to quiet my mind. Is this okay? I know there's a lot of non-biblical things to do. I color. You know, I'm I'm mm -hmm. a lifelong coloring book fanatic, you know, because it helps to unwind my brain, you know. Uh, yep. When the Lord gives me a, a bombshell of truth, you know, my brain becomes extremely active and, you know, whole whole sort of, acti of activity, but, uh, you know, before I go to bed at night, I have to do something to unwind my brain, you know, uh, whether it be coloring and coloring book, you know, doodling, uh, mm -hmm. mapping out something that the Lord has shown me and my brain is starting to brainstorm with note taking. I'm an avid note taker, Yep. <laughs> you know. And again, it's part of the thing of being a godly mother because if you can, you know, again, women nowadays, what do they do when they have a child that's unruly? plop them down in front of a television and throw in a DVD or hand them their iPhone or whatever else like that. Terrible. Absolutely terrible. By her learning how to collar and things like that and liking to collar and whatever, she's going to be ready to impart that to her child. And so when the child starts to get unruly, you say, here, here's your crayons, here's your coloring book, whatever, or a, a pad of paper. Um, right. Show this real quick. I can find one. Um, some of our son's artwork. Maybe it's in the other one. Where's the other one at? Uh, oh, it's underneath this other thing here. Um, be right back. Can tell I tell you what, my here, story real read quick? This, uh, I'll, I'll read this scripture and then you can tell your story. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Okay, Everything is lawful for you. There's another scripture that talks about not being brought under the power of these things. Um, if you're spending more time collaring than you are reading the Bible, than you are praying, that's a problem. Okay, But if you're just doing these things um, you know, to, to learn to, to be very good at collaring so you can eventually teach your children, it's good. Go ahead. I gotta look for the other thing. Um, when I was growing up as a very young child, I loved completing jigsaw puzzles. You know, the the offline based because now there's puzzles online and websites with all that stuff on it. And uh, still, this day, I'm an avid jigsaw puzzler. You know, and I found over the years that uh, when I get into a jigsaw puzzle, my brain does not unwind, even though I go into it thinking, okay, I can do this puzzle to unwind my brain before I go to bed. And then I end up staying up longer because I'm eager to work on the puzzle and finish it in one sitting. And I did jigsaw puzzles in my spare time, even while deployed, you know, in 2010. Um, and, uh, but as a very young girl, I not only did that, but I also liked to color in coloring books. And my grandma would have, she would hide 
boxes and cartons of crayons for me to color with and she'd have coloring books ready for me available and she would only tell me where that stuff was because she knew that if my mother found out um, she would take away the crayon the crayons and the coloring books for me and my mom also did whatever she could growing up to take away the jigsaw puzzles for me and distract me from that oh there's no time for that you know you got to mm -hmm. do this you got to do that because she was trying to prepare her for careerism and things right. like that so yeah and so um, there's nothing wrong with coloring no as long as it doesn't take you away from studying god's word on a daily basis mm -hmm. now everybody brace yourself okay because this is the artwork of our son oliver okay really really amazing stuff okay there we go isn't that beautiful? Okay. If I could put this thing in an art gallery and call it something ridiculous, I could probably get lots of money for it. It's just, it speaks to you, you know? Yes, it's contemporary Whatever. art. <laughs> it's called a three-year-old child with markers, you know? Yeah. But uh, again, we encourage him. We say, oh, that's beautiful. Boy, mm -hmm. son, you're doing a great job. Good job. Stay on the paper, you know? And, right. And and you're, you're teaching, see? And... Um, you know, I mean, certainly we wouldn't have given him markers years ago because he'd have been in the mouth and whatever. And we, right. we bought crayons for him early on thinking he was ready, and no, he wasn't ready. So we took the crayons away, and, you know, now he has them back again, and he's getting ready to do some coloring. So, yep. um, again, you're, you're the thing of coloring. If you're doing it more than, you, than reading the Bible, that's a problem. Um, but if you're just doing it as a stress relief or whatever else or just because you enjoy it there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that so next question um <clears throat> number six how do you know when god is trying to speak with you uh well i would say uh, again um staying in the word of god is the most important thing there uh because you know the devil can try to trick you um, your flesh will try to trick you as well and get you to do things but if it's you know if somebody would if all of a sudden you get this kind of a thought coming into your mind and it's like maybe you ought to get a job that might actually help or whatever else you go wait a second you know the bible says you know i'm to you know you know marry bear children guide the house give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully uh you know wait a second that doesn't make any sense uh, wouldn't that contradict these scriptures here? But all of a sudden, if the Lord, you know, if you get this, you know, thought coming into your mind, because when we say about the Lord speaking to me, it's not an audible voice of you hear this voice and it fills the room and everybody else goes, oh, did you hear that? You know, no, no. It's it's a thought that all of a sudden it just appears out of nowhere and you go, huh? And and you go, wow, that's. Man, that's really something. I got to go look that up. And you go and you get your Bible and, and things. I wonder what the Bible teaches about that. And you, and you do a, a study in the scriptures and you realize, oh, wow, you know, and the Lord, at, while you're doing that, he'll actually bring other scriptures up to your mind. And when you first get saved, you're not going to know many scriptures. Okay. And so this is going to be a process. And again, the more you're in the book, the more you understand God's word, the more you hide it in your heart. Um, the more he's going to reveal to you. And the more you're going to speak it. Yeah. So when he gives and you divine appointments, so to speak, out, you know, running errands and about your day, um, you know, you're going to know scripture that is relevant to whatever the situation is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, I will say this. As a Jew, um, the Bible uh, shows over and over and over again that God dealt with signs and wonders with the Jews and things. Um, so you might see some real supernatural type of things there. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't seek after that. Make it about the Bible. Make it about the Scriptures. Be mighty in the Scriptures. I think that that's important. Um, really understanding, really knowing the Word of God. But the Lord might do some really miraculous things. I mean, again, right now... Um, you're very, very in a very blessed position as a saved Jewess, as the Bible would call you. Um, uh, trying to see where the thing is. Um, I'm 
trying to think of the verse here. Yeah, yeah, Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. He's writing to Gentiles. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Okay? Um, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. God's covenant is still binding. The Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and things there too. He's going to have a king coming. Uh, Jesus Christ is going to come rule and reign the nation of Israel. And that's going to be where the whole world is ruled from. So the Jews are getting stomped on and kicked and spit on. And everybody you know, hates the Jews and all this other stuff. I mean... Donald Trump with this announcement that Jerusalem is the capital city of Israel and all, most of the European countries are coming out and saying this is a terrible thing and the Pope, oh this is so horrible and stuff it's going to get to a point where uh, no actually Jesus is ruling and reigning for a thousand years but my point I'm trying to make is here, blindness in part has happened to Israel All right, in part not all Jews are lost Okay, not all of them have been blinded, you know uh, verse 8, Romans chapter 11, verse 8. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day, um, because they turn to other gods. But there are some Jews, like yourself, that say, I want to be saved. I want to know the truth. I want to hear the truth. And um, God will do great things through you. Okay? Um and don't you know, worry about another what... Another thing I want to say. Go ahead. I was just going to say, and don't worry about what to say when, you know, um, when you're thinking to yourself, how should I witness to my family, you know, my lost family members? How should I witness to such and such type, type of person? Mm -hmm. Be a good student of God's Word. Read your Bible so you know the Scriptures well enough that when He tells you, hey, I've given you an open door of witnessing opportunity here, you know, sees the opportunity, you know, and he'll speak through you. He will tell you what to say at that appointed time. Okay? Yep. So don't worry about, oh, what should I say? What should I do? He will tell you. Mm -hmm. And tying into what she just said, Romans chapter 3, verse 1, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way. Chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So unto you as a Jew, this is this is a Jewish book. There are no Gentiles in the whole book that are, or I should say, there, there, there are no books written by Gentiles. I'll say it that way. Of course, there are Gentiles mentioned. Um, but, you know, Paul writes to you know, Titus. Um, he was a Gentile, okay? Um, but he didn't write the book. Titus didn't write the book of Titus, okay? So it's a Jewish book. You know, then so you can do great things, um, but the key to it all is getting to know this book and understanding this book and reading this book, hiding God's word in your heart, and um, I mean we have seen just from our own lives. I mean we're both German. Uh, you know our ancestors are from Germany, and you know I can tell you that even as you know Gentile Christians, essentially, I mean we're all one in Christ Jesus. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to separate, you know, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. But just to, accepting what we are. As Gentile Christians, our ancestors were pagans if you go back far enough. Okay? Um, we don't have that godly heritage. And I, when I study uh, Jewish sources and things like that, and even watch, you know, rabbis today, uh, Orthodox Jewish rabbis, I do watch some of that stuff, not a whole lot. But, I mean, they have, there's an incredible depth there. Um, you know, there's, uh, a lot of scriptures coming to mind here. Um, just read another verse of scripture. Um, Romans chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is, is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Um, there's a zeal there, a great zealousness among many of the Jews, and I respect that very highly. Uh, I've seen some stuff from rabbis that they come out with talking about Hebrew letters and how, you know, all languages languages are basically jumbled up Hebrew. It's fascinating stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, just amazing. Some people sent me uh, some kind of an audio thing on it and stuff like that, and it's just like, 
anxious to get to studying this stuff more. There's just so much stuff that we got to you know, go through here in this ministry. But you have a great advantage um, when you're a Jewish Christian, a saved Jew. Oh boy, you know, there's, there's so much that, that the Lord can do through you. But the key to it is the scriptures. Right. Uh, that's your advantage because you can say, I understand the book better because my ancestry goes back through the books about my family. Um, there's not a whole lot written about you know the history of the German, the Germanic people, the Anglo-Saxon Saxon people. There's not much about that in the Bible. Okay, it's about the Jews. Right. So, um, kind of got off topic a little bit there, but it's important stuff. So go ahead. Last question. Um, <clears throat> as a lost person, I was told I was quote unquote bipolar. I'm off my meds, but I'm having a hard time. Any advice? Well. I was, as a lost girl, I was forcibly put on medicine to the point of my mom holding my neck in the, mm. in the position and forcing my mouth open even when I tried to not take the medicine and I tried to hide it down the sink and away from them ve viewing me doing this. And, uh, you know, I was called all sorts of different things. Um, I was on what's called benzodiazepines as a lost girl for about, oh, probably one year old to 15 years old if I'm not mistaken some of what I remember I've been told so I don't know how accurate it is but I do remember being on what's called clonazepam or clonopin and uh, the stuff I was on before that which was also probably a anti-anxiety anti, -anxiety, anti uh, probably anti bipolar anti schizophrenia type of medicine but definitely anti-anxiety class of medicine drugs um the first medicine i was on made me so fearful of heights i did not go down the stairs if i saw a set of stairs in my school i would run to the elevator and take the elevator down and up mm -hmm. when i needed to um and then i was taken off of that and put on clonopin for the next several years and fighting my mom the whole time please take me off of it why can't you take me off of it you know and uh so I don't know to this day if they classified me as bipolar, but they did, they classified me as something. And my doctor at the time uh, was known for, he was an expert in ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. Yeah. And I don't or, know if that was there or not either, but, um, you know. So you can relate to the thing of being on that type of medication. Yeah. Now, yeah. what is it that got you away from that as far as when you stopped taking it? Did you, was there some withdrawal stuff? Yes, there was. Um, with withdrawal from pharmaceuticals, prescription especially, you can't just go cold turkey, okay, I'm done with it. You have to slowly ease off of it because, um, you know, certain drugs will stay in your system longer than others. And, you know, depending on what you're eating, if you're eating good stuff, healthy food that will um, beneficially counteract the drugs, it can help you to to detox better. Like for mm -hmm. instance, uh, um, we have what's called a pumpkin spice smoothie and it's, I guess, anti, uh, it's an antidepressant. Um, it's all natural superfood type right. of thing. Um, uh, turmeric, T U R M E R I C. Mm -hmm. I spelled that correctly. Yep. <laughs> and you take turmeric and you put a little, little bit of black pepper with it and it, it creates, um, oh, I cannot think of the word right now but it's a very 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 strong antidepressant and uh, we we take turmeric we take another um, very high vitamin C superfood called camu camu mm -hmm. c-a-m-u uh, times two right <laughs> camu camu and um, uh, we would take some uh, goji berries red goji berries uh, and put these things together and then add in we were using bananas for a while and some like whole yogurt and, uh, plain whole yeah, milk. Plain whole, plain whole milk yogurt. Right. You know, um, and you know you blend it up and things like that, and then you drink that, and it's actually you know comes out tasting, and some cinnamon too, some some. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we get into right. here, but um, and you blend it up and you drink it. It's just like a it's like a you know milk, maybe a little bit thicker than milk consistency, but it tastes like pumpkin, like spiced pumpkin. It's really really good. And you can just feel the difference. Mm -hmm. And again, what that does is that starts to detoxify the body. Right. There's a lot of herbs 
that are very good for detoxifying the body. Again, this is all a major study. You can look into it yourself. Um, we have talked about it a little bit in some of the other studies, but um, it's we're going to give away a little bit of something here, and we're going to be doing a video explaining a little bit more detail. But uh, we have been, she specifically, the Lord has been showing her how to break down chemically um, the organic chemistry formulas for pharmaceutical drugs. Well, they're over the show, counter or prescription. Yeah, to show exactly what is in the chemical makeup of these drugs. It's horrifying. Yes. It is horrifying. I had no idea. I mean, she was just like going off and just saying, oh, this stuff is wicked. It's chemicals and poisonous. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Maybe I don't know. And she started to break down some of the organic chemistry stuff to me. And I started realizing, and, and we're going to be showing some of the materials we have. And uh, this is part of the thing of eventually we need to write this stuff down in books. Video is just not going to work. We'll talk about this in a future video. But... Uh, no, we're not, that sounded bad, didn't it? Video is not going to work. We'll talk about it in a future video. Uh, I'm saying we're going to talk about what the Lord has showed us, but not show all the information. Right. Okay, because it's too much for video. But uh, pharmaceuticals are basically, um, they're based on a few, a lot of different chemicals, but primarily it's um, petroleum. Petro petrochemical hydrocarbons, as it's called. Yeah. Um, in other words, oil. Right. Okay. The now, stuff your car runs on and is made from, you know. Yeah. But in the form of different chemical chemicals like right. benzene, toluene. Methane, ethane, yeah. uh, propane, hexane, uh, pentane. Yeah. So now just think of it this way. Okay. Butane. Let's just say that you smell gasoline. Okay. Really, you know, you put your head down to something and breathe it in and you get, oh boy, and you get a really bad headache. Well, What's it going to take to get rid of that headache? It's going to take time, okay? It has to get out of your system. Just the fumes. Right. Now, what would happen if you mistakenly drank a little bit of that? Well, you're going to have to detox from that. You're going to have to drink lots of water. You're going to have to eat the right kind of foods. And it's going to take, again, it's going to take times, time. Even with the best herbs, even with the best remedies and whatever else, you still have to get that stuff out of your system. And... So it is with pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals, there's not one ingredient in them that it's good. Right. Okay, not one. And I defy anybody that's a pharmacist that knows about pharmaceutical things, prove to us one good thing that's not chemically altered in some way. Okay. Right. A, a big thing is... Um, if uh, it's natural... Um, what's the microcrystalline cellulose? CMC, carboxymethyl... Uh, no, I'm talking about the salt of oh, essentially. Oh, microcrystalline cellulose. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And, and you say, well, that's what is that? Well, it's plant fiber. It's sawdust, essentially. And you say, well, see, that would be good. Yeah, but they use hydrochloric acid to break it down right. to a chemical form where they can use it. So right. even the very, very best, and I shouldn't say best, but even natural, quote unquote, natural things in pharmaceutical drugs, they use chemicals to process it. Right. So there's nothing good about pharmaceutical drugs. And when that stuff gets into your system, it takes time for it to get out. And and also, in addition to to what Brian's saying, if it's sold in a pill bottle or if it's sold in a store, you cannot, you absolutely cannot patent, trademark, copyright, or watermark in any way, shape, and form a real plant product. You know, for instance, mm -hmm. I if I harvest a pound of dandelion greens, I can't just say, I'm going to patent this as a um, dandelion formula for hair, for instance. I can't do that. Why? Because as a real natural product, it has a very short shelf life. Mm -hmm. And the whole purpose behind long shelf life is 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 in the King James Bible. Yeah. Because they have to chemically modify it with some petrochemical toxin of some sort, hydrocarbon toxin, um, to to make it uh, marketable, to make it, uh, you know... Patentable. Patentable, yes. You know, you and were to, thinking that, weren't you? Yes. I thank the Lord for, <laughs> for putting it in your head. But you have to make it unique enough. Yes. That some other dude down the street can't walk out and pick the same herbs and, and make it into a thing and sell it too. Right. You have to say, no, this is my special, you know, formula, doctor 
whatever, Dr. Dellinger's, you know, infamous, you know, mm -hmm. you have to make it patentable. So, right. and another aspect to this whole thing, which I need to, to say is that the petrochemical thing, when you learn about industry, I guess you could call it, um, when you have a raw product, the finer you can break that raw product down and stretch it, the more money you're going to make. Yes. Okay. Back when I used to sell firewood, um, I would sell a cord of firewood. Okay. Bear with me. I know this seems like it's going off on a tangent, but I need to prove this point. A cord of firewood is three rows of firewood, um, 16 inches long, okay, and four feet high, eight feet long. So a cord is four feet wide, four feet high, eight feet long of firewood, and that's how I would sell it. Some people would come and they would say, I don't want the whole thing. Can you sell me one of those rows? That's called a face cord. Well, I would get more money for less, you know, wood. I'm not selling it in bulk, in other words. And then there were guys that were selling at, um, like, convenience stores and stuff like that, and they would take that firewood and just put a couple pieces together and wrap it with plastic and put a little handle on it, and they were getting ridiculous. I mean, they were getting, like, ten times the price of what I could get for the big bulk full cord of wood okay and saying that to prove my point here if you get somebody that says I need to heat my home with fuel oil and they say give me a thousand gallons of oil well it's going to be a lot less than what you get in that little pill the little pill I mean you ought to see the markups on these things these these pills how much it costs the company to make it I mean it's mm -hmm. like not even a, a penny or two and yet they're selling a bottle for hundred and fifty dollars you know it's crazy so again it's the 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 pharmaceutical thing is the biggest money making industry in the world bar none there's yeah. nothing bigger they make more money at the pharmaceutical thing and it goes back to the oil thing look at the oil wars the whole deal that's the big business that's out there and it encompasses every single aspect of our lives Everything yeah. comes from, We're, we from can't oil. Go off. We can't go off but more on that. We'll, that's another we'll, reason why it's so huge. Yeah, we'll talk more about that. But the whole point is that's why there's such a strong pressure. Pharmaceutical pills, it's life, life-saving drugs. Just watch out for all these side effects. You know, right. It's crazy. So don't feel like, oh, maybe I have a problem or let people tell you that you have a problem for wanting nothing to do with pharmaceutical drugs. It's there's a great pressure out there that's put through the media and things like that. Again, television is controlled by the same people that are promoting the pharmaceutical mm -hmm. drugs. That's why there's always the the drug commercials. Try Paxil. It does all this wonderful stuff, and at the end you got got the guy giving all these side effects. You know, there's that pressure there, and they say, "Oh, you're weird if you're trying to get away from it." No, you're not. You have good common sense. Right, a good sense from the Lord, you know. So, right. In answer to the question, um, what can you do? First of all, the bipolar thing is really—I don't even agree with that. I, I did a whole study on the psychiatry and a lot of the mental, quote unquote, mental disorders like Asperger's syndrome, mm -hmm. uh, autism, things like that. There are people that are more inclined to be a little bit reclusive. Um, they're they're more inclined to be able to focus more on real technical detail and you know this whole psychiatry system is created to make people into conformists and so they say well you don't meet our certain standards so therefore we're going to label you with bipolar mm -hmm. autistic Asperger's whatever or schizophrenia and or ADHD yeah, right yeah and so I would I don't believe in bipolar thing I don't believe in that um, and secondly, uh, you're off your meds, but having a hard time, it's going to take a little bit of time. Again, back to my analogy, you smell some gasoline, your headache's not going to be gone when you take the gasoline away like this. It's going to be there for a while. Um, it will eventually go away. And uh, again, I'll just share a little story from my past, and that is uh, right after we got married, We'd moved to a place and there was no way to cook there because they had a uh, natural gas stove and we didn't want that. So I had a little stove, little gas stove out on the front porch and I thought I had enough ventilation. And, uh, you know, I knew that the natural gas stove in the kitchen, there was no ventilation in there. So I thought, well, yes, it's still gas, but at least it's outdoors. Well, some of the fumes from that went into the living room and I was in there putting my books away. 
Um, same exact bookshelf and a lot of these books and things putting my books away. And I was smelling those fumes and I got uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. And for about a week, it felt like somebody was hitting me in the head with a hammer. It was, it was so painful. Migraine headaches are mild compared to what I went through. It was bad. And after that, I had numbness on the left side of my body. And it was like, I'm going, you know, my taste was all messed up. And I mean, I was like thinking I'm ruined for life. <laughs> you know, I, I think I've, you know, suffered some major damage here. And, and, um, but again, we went through the process of detoxing. Uh, sweating is also very, very good. That's another thing. Uh, while you're working, again, an excellent thing. If you're sweating, you're detoxing, you're getting those chemicals out of your body. Um, there's ways to speed that up, the sauna thing and whatever else. But that's there's so many ways that you can study this whole thing. But eating the right kind of foods, sweating, rest, drinking plenty of clean water, um, non-fluoridated water. And no chlorine and, from the town either. Right. Just and, pure spring water. You know, and you're going to start to detoxify. And I don't have any of those ill effects. There's no numbness on the left side of my body anymore. It went away fairly quickly because we were practicing really good health uh, techniques and things. Um, your body has um, cells in it and things like that. Your body's made up of cells and it regenerates those cells at night, every night. And so you're constantly, your body is constantly creating new material. And you need to give your body those building blocks to make good, you know, healthy cell growth. Um, and so, you know, proper nutrition, proper rest. Proper er, And proper exercise. Exercise, yeah. Nutrition, rest, exercise. That's the three-legged stool, so to speak, that keeps you in good shape. So... <laughs> You, uh, people and ask us questions, we kind of can tend to go off a little bit. but A little know. bit. And I want to say this about proper nutrition. Proper nutrition excludes eating out at restaurants and mm -hmm. eateries and whatnot because... Uh, um, there, again, There's a money. whole lot of petrochemicals associated with the preparation of the fast food places and the restaurants mm -hmm. and the eateries. Yep. I can't go into it, The but food is designed to be cooked quickly and... I used to work at a restaurant for five years. I worked at a restaurant. I was a cook. And there's not much care taken to cook things correctly. And I worked at a kind of a fast food place and then also a very, very high class, um, very expensive, you know, making very expensive meals and things too. So very high class and also kind of the fast food. It's pretty much the same with both. Right. And I also okay. was a Pizza Hut waitress in my late teens. And I worked at a what's called a hy grocery store deli slash kitchen and uh, having KP duty in the military, uh, the food is not that healthy. Yeah. Yep. You make it yourself, you know where it came from. Right. And you know how, how it's been cooked. Uh, you know, I just, I got to tell this little story and then we'll quit here. Um, I remember I knew some kids in, in high school and there was this McDonald's um, restaurant near uh, Gap, Pennsylvania. And a lot of the kids would work there, you know, high school kids would get jobs there just to make a few extra dollars or whatever else. And the stories that came out of there, I mean, they were spitting in people's food. Um, they used to have races. They'd, take, they'd catch flies and throw them into the deep vat fryer to see which one survived the longest. I mean, we're talking disgusting. There were cockroaches. There were all kinds of things. So you would do very well to stay away from fast food especially but even restaurant food is bad news yeah. and it's gonna you know again yes you're producing more cells in your body but if you're constantly putting more junk food in and hurting your health it's gonna take your body that much longer to detoxify that much longer to get into really good health right and um, I destroyed my health pretty much for uh, oh, 35 years of my life um, ate junk food, candy, huge amounts of candy, to the point of getting sick. I ate too much, so much candy. I mean, I just ruined my health for 35 years. Um, we got married, and uh, when I was 36, I think, and um, I was just kind of getting into some natural health type of stuff, uh, raw milk and things like that. And we really, you know, cracked down and really have been eating good. I feel better than I ever have. So even though you might have destroyed things and been on medication for a while. Don't give up hope. 
and think, well, I'm just ruined, I'm just shot. Uh, your body can bounce back from some pretty bad health. Right. Okay. So that is going to be it. I hope that we've answered your question. Please feel free to write uh, more letters. Uh, we love questions like this. This is really some really good questions. Um, and yeah. raw milk meaning grass-fed raw milk, not grain. Yeah. yeah. We can keep going on and on and on. Just wanted but, to add you know, that. Yeah. Um, so I think that's going to be it. So, as far as I know. Um, if we haven't answered anything or you say, well, I meant such and such, just write us, let us know, and um, we'll make more videos and things. And anybody else out there, um, you know, again, I took down my email address because I was just getting people and they'd send me links to articles and things and, and huge big emails and asking me a lot of questions. And, you know, a lot of them, like, I'm, I already have videos on this or whatever. And, uh, you know, they weren't. It's just, you know, more argument and stuff like that, and I just don't have time for answering all that stuff. So the best way to get a hold of us is through our ministry, P.O. Box. Um, it's P.O. Box 335, Bridgewater, Maine, uh, 04735. Just write to King James Radio Ministries. Uh, don't ever address Catherine. Her name's not listed over at the post office. So write to either Brian Denlinger or King James Radio Ministries, and uh, it'll get to us. And we'll answer you like this. And it, you know, please make sure to say, re, you know, read my name, or please don't read my name, or whatever. And uh, we'll get back to you. So that's going to be it. Yep. And uh, thank you very much for the letter. It's great to hear from you. And um, I guess we'll see you later. Yep. Okay.